Sherlock Holmes was in a melancholy and philosophic mood that morning. His alert, practical nature was subject to such reactions. Did you see him? he asked. You mean the old fellow has just gone out? Precisely. Yes, I met him at the door. What did you think of him? A pathetic, futile, broken creature. Exactly, Watson. Pathetic and futile. But is not all life pathetic and futile? Is not his story a microcosm of the whole? We reach, we grasp, and what is left in our hands at the end, a shadow. Or worse than a shadow. Misery. Is he one of your clients? Well, I suppose I may call him so. He has been sent on by the yard. Just as medical men occasionally send their incurables to a quack. They argue that they can do nothing more, and that whatever happens, the patient can be no worse than he is. What is the matter? Holmes took a rather soiled card from the table. Josiah Amberley. He says he was a junior partner of Brick Fallen Amberley, who are manufacturers of artistic materials. You will see their names upon paint boxes. He made his little pile, retired from business at the age of sixty-one, bought a house at Lewisham, and settled down to rest after life of ceaseless grind. One would think his future was tolerably assured. Yes, indeed. Holmes glanced over some notes which he had scribbled upon the back of an envelope. Retired in 1896, Watson. Early in 1897 he married a woman twenty years younger than himself. A good-looking woman, too, if the photograph does not flatter. A competence, a wife, leisure. It seemed a straight road which lay before him. And yet, within two years he is, as you have seen, as broken and miserable a creature as crawls beneath the sun. But what has happened? The old story, Watson. A treacherous friend and a fickle wife. It would appear that Amberley has one hobby in life, and it is chess. Not far from him at Lewisham there lives a young doctor who is also a chess player. I have noted his name as Dr. Ray Ernest. Ernest was frequently in the house, and an intimacy between him and Mrs. Amberley was a natural sequence. For well, you must admit that our unfortunate client has few outward graces, whatever his inner virtues may be. The couple went off together last week, destination untraced. What is more, the faithless spouse carried off the old man's deed-box as her personal luggage with a good part of his life's savings within. Can we find the lady? Can we save the money? A commonplace problem so far as it has developed, and yet a vital one for Josiah Amberley. What will you do about it? Well, the immediate question, my dear Watson, happens to be, what will you do? if you will be good enough to understudy me. You know that I am preoccupied with this case of the two Coptic patriarchs, which should come to a head today. I really have not time to go out to Lewisham, and yet evidence taken on the spot has a special value. The old fellow was quite insistent that I should go, but I explain my difficulty. He is prepared to meet a representative. By all means. I answered. I confess I don't see that I can be of much service, but I am willing to do my best. And so it was that on a summer afternoon I set forth to Lewisham, little dreaming that within a week the affair in which I was engaging would be the eager debate of all England. It was late that evening before I returned to Baker Street and gave an account of my mission. Holmes lay with his gaunt figure stretched in his deep chair, his pipe curling forth slow wreaths of acrid tobacco, while his eyelids drooped over his eyes so lazily that he might almost have been asleep, were it not that any halt or questionable passage of my narrative they half lifted, and two grey eyes, as bright and keen as rapiers, 
transfixed me with their searching glare. The Haven is the name of Mr. Josiah's Amberley's house, I explained. I think it would interest you, Holmes. It is like some penurious patrician who has sunk into the company of his inferiors. You know that particular quarter, the monotonous brick streets, the weary suburban highways? Right in the middle of them, a little island of ancient culture and comfort, lies this old home surrounded by a high sun-baked wall mottled with lichens and topped with moss. The sort of wall... Cut out the poetry, Watson, said Holmes severely. I note that it was a high brick wall. Exactly. I should not have known which was the haven, had I not asked a lounger who was smoking in the street. I have reason for mentioning him. He was a tall, dark, heavily moustached, rather military-looking man. He nodded in answer to my inquiry and gave me a curiously questioning glance, which came back to my memory a little later. I had hardly entered the gateway before I saw Mr. Amberley coming down the drive. I only had a glimpse of him this morning, and he certainly gave me the impression of a strange creature. But when I saw him in full light, his appearance was even more abnormal. I have, of course, studied it, and yet I should be interested to have your impression, said Holmes. He seemed to me like a man who was literally bowed down by care. His back was curved as though he carried a heavy burden. Yet he was not the weakling that I had at first imagined, for his shoulders and chest have the framework of a giant, though his figure tapers away into a pair of spindled legs. Left shoe wrinkled, right one smooth. I did not observe that. No, you wouldn't. I spotted his artificial limb, but proceed. I was struck by the snaky locks of grizzled hair, which curled from under his old straw hat, and his face with its fierce, eager expression, and the deeply lined features. Very good, Watson. What did he say? He began pouring out the story of his grievances. We walked down the drive together, and of course I took a good look round. I have never seen a worse kept place. The garden was all running to seed, giving me an impression of wild neglect, in which the plants had been allowed to find the way of nature rather than of art. How any decent woman could have tolerated such a stage of things, I don't know. The house, too, was slatternly to the last degree, but the poor man seemed himself to be aware of it, and to be trying to remedy it, for a great pot of green paint stood in the centre of the hall, and he was carrying a thick brush in his left hand. He had been working on the woodwork. He took me into his dingy sanctum, and we had a long chat. Of course, he was disappointed that you had not come yourself. I hardly expected, he said, that so humble an individual as myself, especially after my heavy financial loss, could obtain the complete attention of so famous a man as Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I assured him that the financial question did not arise. No, of course, it is art for art's sake with him, said he, but even on the artistic side of crime he might have found something here to study. And human nature, Dr. Watson the black ingratitude of it all. When did I ever refuse one of her requests? Was ever a woman so pampered? And that young man, he might have been my own son. He had the run of my house. And yet see how they have treated me. Oh, Dr. Watson, it is a dreadful, dreadful world. That was the burden of his song for an hour or more. He had, it seems, no suspicion of an intrigue. They lived alone, save for a woman who comes in by the day and leaves every evening at six. On that particular evening, old Amberley, wishing to give his wife a treat, had taken two upper-circle seats at the haymarket. At the last moment she had complained of a headache and had refused to go. He had gone alone. It was undoubtedly the tall, dark man whom I had addressed in the street. I saw him once more at London Bridge, and then I lost him in the crowd. But I am convinced that he was following me. No doubt, no doubt, said Holmes. 
A tall, dark, heavily moustached man, you say, with grey-tinted sunglasses? Holmes, you are a wizard. I did not say so, but he had grey-tinted sunglasses. And a Masonic tie-pin? Holmes! Quite simple, my dear Watson. But let us get down to what is practical. I must admit to you that the case which seemed to me to be so absurdly simple as to be hardly worth my notice is rapidly assuming a very different aspect. It is true that though in your mission you have missed everything of importance, yet even those things which have obtruded themselves upon your notice give rise to serious thought. What have I missed? Don't be hurt, my dear fellow. You know that I am quite impersonal. No one else would have done better. Some, possibly, not so well. But clearly you have missed some vital points. What is the opinion of the neighbours about this man Amberley and his wife? That, surely, is of importance. What of Dr. Ernest? Was he the gay Lothario one would expect? With your natural advantages, Watson, every lady is your helper and accomplice. What about the girl at the post office, or the wife of the greengrocer? I can picture you whispering soft nothings with the young lady at the blue anchor, and receiving hard somethings in exchange. Corina sings tonight at the Albert Hall, and we still have time to dress, dine, and enjoy. In the morning I was up betimes, but some toast crumbs and two empty eggshells told me that my companion was earlier still. I found a scribbled note upon the table. Dear Watson, there are one or two points of contact which I should wish to establish with Mr. Josiah Amberley. When I have done so, we can dismiss the case, or not. I would only ask you to be on hand about three o'clock, as I conceive it possible that I may want you. S. H. I saw nothing of Holmes all day, but at the hour named he returned, grave, preoccupied, and aloof. At such times it was wiser to leave him to himself. Has Amley been here yet? No. Ah, I am expecting him. He was not disappointed, for presently the old fellow arrived with a very worried and puzzled expression upon his austere face. I've had a telegram, Mr. Holmes. I can make nothing of it. He handed it over, and Holmes read it aloud. Come at once without fail, can give you information as to your recent loss, Elman, the vicarage. Dispatched at 2.10 from Little Purlington, said Holmes. Little Purlington is in Essex, I believe, not far from Frinton. Well, of course, you will start at once. This is evidently from a responsible person, the vicar of the place. Where is my Crockford? Yes, we have him. J. C. Elman, M. A., living of Moosmore, come Little Purlington. Look up the trains, Watson. There is one at 5.20 from Liverpool Street. Excellent. You had best go with him, Watson. He may need help or advice. Clearly we have come to a crisis in this affair, but our clients seem by no means eager to start. It is perfectly absurd, Mr. Holmes. What can this man possibly know of what has occurred? It is a waste of time and money. He would not have telegraphed you if he did not know something. Wire at once that you are coming. I don't think I shall go. Holmes assumed his sternest aspect. It would make the worst possible impression both on the police and upon myself, Mr. Amberley, if, when so obvious a clue arose, you should refuse to follow it up. We should feel that you were not really in earnest in this investigation. Our client seemed horrified at the suggestion. Why, of course I shall go, if you look at it in that way, said he. On the face of it, it seems absurd to suppose that this parson knows anything, but if you think... I do think said Holmes, with emphasis, and so we were launched upon our journey. Holmes took me aside before we left the room and gave me one word of counsel, 
which showed that he considered the matter to be of importance. Whatever you do, see that he really does go, said he. Should he break away or return, get to the nearest telephone exchange and send the single word bolted. I will arrange here that it shall reach me wherever I am. Little Burlington is not an easy place to reach, for it is on a branch line. It was soon apparent to me that my companion's reputation as a miser was not undeserved. He had grumbled at the expense of the journey, had insisted upon travelling third class, and was now clamorous in his objections to the hotel bill. Next morning, when we did at last arrive in London, it was hard to say which of us was in the worse humour. "'You had best take Baker Street as we pass,' said I. "'Mr. Holmes may have some fresh instructions. "'If they are not worth more than the last ones, they are not of much use,' said Amberley with a malevolent scowl. "'Nonetheless, he kept me company. "'I had already warned Holmes by telegram of the hour of our arrival, "'but we found a message waiting that he was at Lewisham and would expect us there.' That was a surprise, but an even greater one was to find that he was not alone in the sitting-room of our client. A stern-looking, impassive man sat beside him, a dark man with grey-tinted glasses and a large masonic pin projecting from his tie. "'This is my friend Mr. Barker,' said Holmes. "'He has been interesting himself also in your business, Mr. Josiah Amberley.' though we have been working independently. But we both have the same question to ask you. Mr. Amberley sat down heavily. He sensed impending danger. I read it in his straining eyes and his twitching features. What is the question, Mr. Holmes? Only this. What did you do with the bodies? The man sprang to his feet with a hoarse scream. He clawed into the air with his bony hands. The irregulars are useful sometimes, you know. You, for example, with your compulsory warning about whatever he said being used against him, could never have bluffed this rascal into what is virtually a confession. Perhaps not. But we get there all the same, Mr. Holmes. Don't imagine that we had not formed our own views of this case, and that we would not have laid our hands on our men. You will excuse us for feeling sore when you jump in with methods which we cannot use, and so rob us of the credit. There shall be no such robbery, MacKinnon. I assure you that I efface myself from now onward, and as to Barker, he has done nothing save what I told him. The inspector seemed considerably relieved. That is very handsome of you, Mr. Holmes. Praise or blame can matter little to you, but it is very different to us when the newspapers begin to ask questions. Quite so. But they are pretty sure to ask questions anyhow, so it would be as well to have answers. What will you say, for example, when the intelligent and enterprising reporter asks you what the exact points were which aroused your suspicion and finally gave you a certain conviction as to the real facts. The inspector looked puzzled. We don't seem to have got any real facts yet, Mr. Holmes. You say that the prisoner, in the presence of three witnesses, practically confessed by trying to commit suicide, that he had murdered his wife and her lover. What other facts have you? Have you arranged for a search? There are three constables on their way. Then you will soon get the clearest fact of all. The bodies cannot be far away. Try the cellars and the garden. It should not take long to dig up the likely places. This house is older than the water pipes. There must be a disused well somewhere. I was already certain that the case was serious, for I had examined the box office chart at the Haymarket Theatre. Another of Dr. Watson's bullseyes. And ascertained that neither B30 nor 32 of the upper circle 
had been occupied that night. Therefore, Ambley had not been to the theatre, and his alibi fell to the ground. He made a bad slip when he allowed my astute friend to notice the number of the seat taken for his wife. The question now arose how I might be able to examine the house. I sent an agent to the most impossible village I could think of, and summoned my man to it at such an hour that he could not possibly get back. To prevent any miscarriage, Dr. Watson accompanied him. The good vicar's name I took, of course, out of Mike Crockford. Do I make it all clear to you? It is masterly, said the inspector, in an awed voice. There being no fear of interruption, I proceeded to burgle the house. Burglary has always been an alternative profession had I cared to adopt it, and I have little doubt that I should have come to the front. Observe what I found. You see the gas pipe along the skirting here? Very good. It rises in the angle of the wall, and there is a tap here in the corner. The pipe runs out into the strong room, as you can see, and ends in that plaster rose in the centre of the ceiling, where it is concealed by the ornamentation. That end is wide open. At any moment by turning the outside tap, the room could be flooded with gas. With door and shutter closed and the tap full on, I would not give two minutes of conscious sensation to anyone shut up in that little chamber. By what devilish device he decoyed them there I do not know, but once inside the door they were at his mercy. The inspector examined the pipe with interest. One of our officers mentioned the smell of gas, said he, but of course the window and door were open then, and the paint, or some of it, was already about. What would you do? Write a message. Exactly. You would like to tell people how you died. No use writing on paper. That would be seen. If you wrote on the wall, someone might rest upon it. Now look here. Just above the skirting is scribbled with a purple indelible pencil. We, we, that's all. What do you make of that? Well, it's only a foot above the ground. If you find an indelible pencil on a body, we'll look out for it, you may be sure. But those securities, clearly there was no robbery at all and yet he did possess those bonds. We verified that. You may be sure that he has them hidden in a safe place. When the whole elopement had passed into history, he would suddenly discover them and announce that the guilty couple had relented and sent back the plunder or had dropped it on the way. You certainly seem to have met every difficulty, said the inspector. I have consulted not only the police, but even Sherlock Holmes. The inspector laughed. We must forgive you your even, Mr. Holmes, said he. It's as workmanlike a job as I can remember. A couple of days later, my friend tossed across to me a copy of the bi-weekly North Surrey Observer. Under a series of flaming headlines which began with The Haven Horror and ended with brilliant police investigation. There was a packed column of print which gave the first consecutive account of the affair. The concluding paragraph is typical of the whole. It ran thus. The remarkable acumen by which Inspector McKinnon deduced from the smell of paint that some other smell, that of gas, for example, might be concealed. The bold deduction that the strong room might also be the death chamber, and the subsequent inquiry which led to the discovery of the bodies in a disused well, cleverly concealed by a dog kennel, should live in the history of crime as a standing example of the intelligence of our professional detectives.
Well, well, McKinnon is a good fellow, said Holmes, with a tolerant smile. You can file it in our archives, Watson. Some day the true story may be told. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.